The most used word in the King James Version of the Bible is, and you might think of this if you just think a little bit about it, it's God. And I, I personally, when I started looking, or when I went to look it up, I didn't really think, or, or it didn't, hadn't crossed my mind that that was the word. And it leads by a far, a big, tall margin. It's used 400, or I'm sorry, 4,444 times in the King James Version of the Bible. That includes Old and New Testaments. Way behind it is another similar word, Father, but it's only used 979 times. Father. Now, there's probably some, if, certainly if you look at different versions of the Bible, different translations of the Bible, you will find that there are uh, differences because some people or some versions, translations would, may not translate it God all the time. It might say him or it might say father where they think that's implied and so forth or, or some other um, type of a word. So it would change that. But in the King James Version, that's what it is. Some time ago, actually in uh, 2000, uh, a movie came out. And my wife and I watched it, and we were touched by it. We, we, um, it was a, I think they call them dramedy, which I think is a cross between a drama and a comedy. And it was both, but it was a love story. It was called Return to Me, and it starred David Duchovny and Minnie Driver. And I'm sure some of you have seen the movie or watched the movie. They also, not these two, but uh, he had a bulldog named Mel. And he was a, uh, I don't know if he was a, you know, bulldogs are pretty good size, and he was a joyful dog, and so he, he, uh, he didn't cause problems, but in his exuberance he might have caused some, some issues and problems at times. But at any rate, as the movie goes, you don't really see this in totality. The movie is, is uh, rated PG, I think, but it would be probably rated G for general audiences if not for some profane and maybe uh, uh, offensive language in it. Otherwise, it probably, because there's not much, there's no uh, sexual uh, situations or occurrences. There is no violence in it. So some of the things that would cause it to be rated R or some other designation are not in it. And again, only, only because of the language. And it's not extreme, but it's still more than a PG, or than a G general audience would, um, would warrant. So uh, the movie, though, was a good, generally a good movie. And somewhat, it could have been somewhat realistic although I've never heard of it happening, but the wife and the husband were in an auto accident. She was killed, and he was left by himself, and of course, he grieved for quite some time about this, and it took him a long time to sort of integrate back into society a little bit and so forth, but in a year or so, his, one of his good friends convinced him to go on a blind date, so he did. And the blind date went kaput. It, it went nowhere. But he went to this Italian, small Italian family-owned restaurant. And I think he left a code or something behind. And the waitress had been very nice. So he called, and he went back at a later date, maybe even later that evening, or at some later point, I believe, if I recall, to get his coat, and he something he sort of detected that there was something different about or something about this waitress that he liked or that, that um, uh, this struck him for some reason. So he went back some more and before you knew it, they actually began to, uh, at first, I don't think they went on formal dates, but they began, began to spend some time together. And I think they went somewhere with the dog Mel and the dog seemed to figure out that there was something about this person too, and the dog liked the girl. 
many that many driver played and they couldn't quite figure all this out but as they went along she they found out or she finally she was trying to hide it she she had big scar cuz she had had a heart transplant and as they went along they put things together and they figured out that she had gotten his former wife's heart and this was probably why the dog because I don't know and I don't know if that's realistic or not but it could be I could see that that would be the case possibly but the dog seemed to de detect that and that was why but it created a whole new set of circumstances because now he had a divided opinion he didn't know whether this was partly his old wife or what exactly it was that was causing him he liked her but he started actually to distance himself well as the movie goes and it's a movie so anything that you want to happen can happen and of course everybody wanted to ha uh, the viewers and and everybody wanted them to be together which eventually they were but what I want to talk about is the third most common word or most used word in the Bible and that word is heart it's the third most used word in the King James Version of the Bible Old Testament and New Testament and I want to talk about a not so much a divided heart but what does God want from our heart what does God want from our heart. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. We'll, we'll look back in the book of Hosea, which is one of the, actually it's the, either the first or the second, I can't remember if Daniel is considered to be a minor prophet or not. I think he's one of the prophets and, and Hosea is uh, just one of the first one of the minor prophets. But anyway, it's the book after Daniel, Hosea. Now Hosea was, he had a, quite the time of it, quite frankly. He was, his name means salvation. And <clears throat> he was a minister to the, or a preacher, a prophet to the northern kingdom, the northern ten tribes of Israel, up with, with their capital in uh, Samaria. Outwardly, the nation was prospering, doing well and you would think everything is going great and so on but inwardly moral corruption had and spiritual idolatry had taken place and was beginning to grow and it was getting stronger and it was getting out of hand and and they had become wealthy but they were they were decaying from within and he actually was compelled by God to take a wife of harlotry, harlotry, a prostitution, if you will, or prosti prostitute, if you will, and he. This was all as an example to the nation around him, and they had a couple of sons and and a daughter, and they were named certain names that were also characteristic of what was going on or what was going to happen in the nation. We're going to chapter 10, if you want to find chapter 10 of Hosea. Uh, back there, as I said, it was the next book after Daniel. And, <coughs> excuse me, it says in verse 1 of chapter 10, we'll just read chapter 1 and 2, and it points out what happens with divided loyalty and it happens that same type of thing happens it's happening perhaps in our nation right now as as we speak and has been for some time it says in verse 1 and again this is pointed at the the Israelites the ten nations of Israel even Ephraim back in in 916 is mentioned and Ephraim often stands for the whole nation because it was sort of the capital of the or the ruling uh, part of the nation but anyway verse 1 Israel empties his vine in other words he goes out and he harvests 
and he brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of, the land, of his land, they have embellished his sacred, it says here, pillars. But those pillars were not pillars to God, at least not the true God. They were pillars to God and altars to God, but they were pagan altars, and they fell into pagan idolatry. And here's what's going to happen. It says in verse 2, their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He, being God, will break down their altars, and he will ruin their sacred pillars. A society that gets wealthy, it's hard for them to keep their eyes focused on God. It really is. It's really the same with individuals when you break it down because a nation is nothing more than the collection of individuals that are in that nation. And the same thing happens oftentimes. It doesn't have to, but it can, and the strong inclination and temptation is there for that to happen. So again, what does God want from our heart? Certainly not a divided heart. The heart, let's, let's uh, look at what the heart does and what is implicated here. And this is according to the Cleveland Clinic website. It's, the heart is really incredible when you think about it, but then so is every part of our body, whether it's the nose, the hearing, the eyes, or any other part of our body. Sometimes I wonder how we can, you know, with these little feet we have, how we can stand upright and stay upright. Uh, sometimes I have trouble with that anyway, but, but uh, all of the whole body is marvelous. It's incredible how it works, but the heart, let me tell you a few things about the heart. It goes on 24-7, 365, or in some years, 366, if it happens to be a leap year. It's about an average of maybe nine ounces. Women generally tend to have about eight-ounce hearts as an average. Men generally have about 10-ounce hearts, and so that would tend to make the average maybe around nine ounces. Their function, the, the function of the heart is to pump blood with oxygen, nourishment to all parts of the body, everywhere, the whole, your, your, the tip of your little toe to the you know, last peak, maybe in my case, of your head. The, lad, the top of your head is what the, the heart does. It pumps it everywhere, if it's working correctly and most of ours are, or we wouldn't probably be here, at least uh, for the most part. And the other thing is, it carries waste to the lungs and kidneys for elimination to be expelled out of the body. It's a system of blood vessels, arteries, veins, capillaries, and this I found to be incredible. That's over 60,000 miles long. I know that there are little, I don't know why, whether there are veins, arteries, or what, for example, in an, in an eye, that are so tiny, so microscopic, that they can, you can't see them, but they're there. But, uh, and when I was thinking about this, I thought of that commercial, when, when I thought about the fact that you can't see that artery, I thought about the commercial I see, and you've probably seen it. The guy, little boy asks his dad, Dad, what is torque? And he goes into this long explanation of what is torque. And, of course, it bores the little child. And then he says, has another question for Dad. He said, Dad, why can't I see my eyeballs? And I was thinking, yeah, that is a good question. You've got eyes to see, but you can't see them. So, it, but at any rate, 60,000 miles is a lot of linear feet for blood to go through, for the heart to pump through. The heart pumps about five quarts a minute or 2,000 gallons a day, and it beats approximately 100,000 times a day. That's 60 to 100 beats per minute, and if you do that over you know, the minutes of a year or a day, you'll, you'll find that. 70 year, in 70 years, it beats over two and a half million times. 
And the other thing I found incredible, 60,000 miles of hearts ves or of vessels, capillaries, arteries, veins, and so forth, takes it approximately 20 seconds to circulate the whole system. Now that's, it's an incredible thing. The heart is the core of our being. It's the core of our body. I, the, the, we can't live without our brain, without our heart, but I shouldn't say that. We can live without our brain to an extent. They can keep us alive. I was in the hospital and my sister was in the hospital years ago. She was in a coma, but she was expected to recover, which she did to some extent. There was a lady lying in the bed next to her. For the whole time we were there, she was brain dead, but she was, they still kept her breathing. She was still alive. She wasn't dead. She was brain dead, but she was still alive. And they couldn't, and, and this, she was here for uh, about a week at this particular facility or that particular room or whatever. That whole time that lady was lying there, she was alive, but her brain was dead. They were waiting for her family to come and say they could take her off of the, uh, of, of the life support, which they, I'm assuming, eventually did. Or they may have like a last day or so that we were there for this, for this lady. So it can, the, the body can be alive without the brain, but it can't be alive without the heart. Excuse me. The meaning of heart in the Bible is the mind, the understanding, the feelings, the will. It's the center or core of anything as described or explained in the Bible. And there are a lot of different, we'll just go through a couple of small examples of the heart. A few times it's actually, the word is actually meaning our physical heart. But not very often, most times it is has the meaning of our, the core of our being or the center of our being. The, the words that are used, and I won't try to pronounce them all, they're about, in the Old Testament, there are two different words. They're number 3820 and 3824 in the Strong's Concordance. And they, they mean just what I uh, mentioned to you. In the New Testament, it's number 20, which would be the Greek, number 2588, and that word is easier to pronounce. It's cardia, from which we get the word cardiac, is what that particular word is, but it means basically the same thing, the heart and core of our being. It could be something is in the heart of the ocean or heart of the sea, as a couple of places. The first time it's used is in Genesis, the sixth chapter. And already, that early, the human race is in trouble. Because notice in Genesis, the sixth chapter, I could get there faster to these things, but if I put little markers in here, then I'm there right away and I'll get there before anybody else and I don't want to do that, so I, so I don't. Uh, in Genesis, the sixth chapter, and we'll read verses five and six, now this was at some point just before he gave Noah the instructions to build an ark. <laughs> In verse 1 it says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. So that's the, uh, this was, well, the verse before that in, the, in 30, verse 32 of chapter 5 says, Noah was 500 years old and he had sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But anyway, dropping down then to verse 5, when these men had begun to multiply in the earth, said, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Already at that, probably wasn't that early, but it was still way, way back behind our particular history. The wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every, this is what God saw, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So man's heart, he said, was, was evil. The thoughts of his heart. And I, I know there is some conjecture, or I've heard some uh, 
maybe theories or, or I don't know if there's any real truth to it or not, but that the heart has sort of a of its own little uh, brain, I guess you would call, and maybe it does. But verse 6 says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved at his heart. So God had a heart too, and it uses it pretty much the same way as it was here as well. Another place, the first place that we find it in the New Testament is in Matthew, the fifth chapter, and it's part of the Beatitudes, Matthew 5 and verse 8, and this is the first place in the New Testament that we find it. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, and this is positive, for they shall see God. It's the opposite pretty much of what uh, we found in um, uh, Genesis, the sixth chapter. The blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there are two sides to it. Jeremiah has a description of the natural heart. Jeremiah 17. And when I say the natural heart, I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about the nature that is in mind, in man, or the, the uh, human nature that is in man. Jeremiah 17, and this is in verse 9. I know we're going through a lot of scriptures pretty quickly, and we will here for a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeremiah 17, and in verse 9 it says, The heart is deceitful, which means it's fraudulent or crooked, above all things, and it is desperately wicked, which says, the, the translation of that is, that it is, it is it is incurably sick. Now that is incurably, it's incurably sick without God, without the death of Jesus Christ and so on, without God's spirit and so forth. It's not obviously the heart can become better, but it takes training, it takes work and so forth. So the heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked. Some people in the Bible followed God with their whole heart. Josiah was one of those in just 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter. 2 Kings 22, it's 1st and 2nd Samuel, then 1st and 2nd Kings. Twenty-two. In we'll read verse one and two, then we'll go to chapter twenty-three. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Can you imagine that? An eight-year-old leader? It's it's hard to imagine. I'm sure he had a lot of um, advisors around him. He had he would have had to have, but it just probably was the natural progression of things when his father died. There was actually a uh, uh, I believe there was some shenanigans going on, and I believe his father was murdered, I believe, assassinated. Um, I didn't really look it up, but I've read it a number of times. And anyway, he was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedida, Jedida the daughter of Adaiah of Baska, or Bathkas. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. Now you remember David was a man after God's own heart. But he walked, Josiah walked in all the ways of his father David, which was not his father, but it was his ancestor is what it means. And there's one of those words father that makes up the 979 times that the word father is used. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. So he did what was right in the sight of God. In verse or in chapter 23, just another page over in my Bible. In 23 and in verse 3 says the king, that being Josiah, stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart 
and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant. He made a commitment to follow God with his whole heart. A lot of the kings of, of uh, Judah and even more of the kings of Israel. In fact, I don't think there was one king that was very, of, of Israel, the northern ten tribes, that was very <clears throat> good or very pure. They were all bad, pretty much all bad kings, and that's why they went into captivity a couple hundred years before uh, Judah went into captivity. Then in Second Chronicles, here, here's another king of Israel. Second Chronicles, chapter 25. Second Chronicles 25, and we'll read 1 and 2, and then verse 14. This is Amaziah, King Amaziah. It was in here this morning. There it is. Second Chronicles 25, 1 and 2. It says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. <clears throat> His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of God, but not with a loyal heart. Not with a loyal heart. He didn't do it wholeheartedly. He did it half-heartedly. And an example of this is in um, uh, chapter or verse 14. 14. Now, in verse 14, just a little bit on further down. Now it was so, after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, set them up to be his gods, and bowed down to them before them and burned incense to them. Now that's a direct violation of thou shalt have no other gods before me. They were not to do this. So he sort of half-heartedly did it when it suited him, but it didn't take him long to begin to drift away from God and to have other gods before the true God, which he was not supposed to do, and especially as a leader of people. You're supposed to be an example and not a bad example. As, as was pointed out some time ago in a sermonette, you can be an example in more ways than one. You could be a good example, but you can also be a bad example, and I guess that's what we have to look at if there is somebody that's not doing what they should, let's not do that, I guess. So he was half-hearted. Then, you know, also in Second Chronicles, this one is in Second Chronicles 12, just back a few chapters. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 12. This is now an example of a stone-cold heart, a heart that is not wholehearted for God, but basically wholehearted to do evil. And this was Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son. And you might remember the story the, where the kingdom became divided at the end of uh, Solomon's life, where the, his son, Rehoboam, had a, a chance to, to rule the whole nation, and the, he asked for advice from the elders, and they, uh, should I make it harder or easier for my subjects in the kingdom? In this, in this kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. And they advised him, well, make it easier and the people will be glad to follow you. Then he went to his young friends, the gang he hung out with, and they told him, no, make it harder, make it harder. Collect more taxes, put more burdens on them. You want, you, you want this for yourself, selfishness. And of course, the result was a divided kingdom. Now, this was, uh, this was pretty much um, predetermined already that that was going to happen because God had set up Jeroboam, who ended up being the king of the, king of the, the north, not that king of the north, but a king of the north, the northern uh, divided kingdoms, or divided tribes, rather, and he was that. So <clears throat> uh, Rehoboam, though, in verse 1, is where we first the first mention is there, and he was uh, the the king. 
I was just there. I should have stayed there. And I came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom once he got it under control and had strengthened himself that he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel went along with him. He forsook it all. But in verse 14 again, it says, And he did, still talking about Rehoboam, he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. And prepare the heart, it means he did not fix his heart on God. He did not fix his heart on God. So he had just sort of predetermined that he was going in, in another direction. He thought that he was would gonna, was going to be able to do whatever he wanted and there would be no consequences. Like Jeremiah said, though, the heart is evil and it is incurably sick, the natural heart, human nature. But I want to talk for the next few minutes about a man that was an example of a wholehearted devotion to God and what he did and what we can emulate, what we can do also that will help us to be in wholehearted conformity with God, with God's way, and so forth. And that man... His, his name was Ezra, and he has a book named after him, the book of Ezra, which is just before the book of uh, Nehemiah, which is just before the book of Esther. It's actually just a little after, or it's actually the next book after uh, Second Chronicles, really. But Ezra, and we'll read a little bit about him, and we'll talk about him for a few minutes. Ezra was a remarkable man. You, you have to remember that Ezra, he was a scribe, which a scribe was a student or even, and, and a teacher of the law, but he was not in Jerusalem. He was not in Judea. He was not in Israel. He was a captive in Babylon. He was one of the captives of, uh, in the, in the uh, nation of Babylon that uh, King, Neb King Nebuchadnezzar had uh, destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And he was uh, in that country and not in his own home country. But adversity makes people, or can make, it doesn't always, but it can make people shine. Some of their strengths, some of the strongest examples and lights come out of adversity uh, of any circumstance in life, as, as we saw uh, with uh, some of the other, the other uh, people here, like in Hosea, where they had the divided heart <clears throat> when they got rich and it was easy and so forth. That's when they went, it collapsed, and that's when they... they uh, uh, had their biggest problems were here this was the opposite extreme this was in in uh, a land where they were captives where they were uh, s to some extent slaves and so forth but this man was a shining light and a shining example it starts talking about him in Ezra chapter 7 after these things and there it, it goes through a number of things here where they had uh, uh, returned. Some of them had returned from captivity and had gone up to Jerusalem to try to rebuild it a little bit and so forth. And he said, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, and I won't go through all these names, but it goes all the way back in, verse four, or in uh, chapter 5. It traces his lineage all the way back to Aaron, which means he was a Levite, and he was not just your everyday run-of-the-mill Levite. He was part of the priest or the Aaronic priesthood of of uh, the tribe of Levi. But Ezra became involved here. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he it says in verse six he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses. So here he was, 
He was in captivity. Daniel was the same way. And, and the remarkable thing about Daniel and his three friends, we have a whole book to describe that. Here Ezra is in a similar circumstance, and he also shines. And Ezra, as we look at this just a little bit, Ezra must have been, maybe he was a liaison between the Jew, uh, and the captives and the uh, uh, Artaxerxes and his regime because he had a lot of weight and pull as we can see here just from from thinking about it as we read it he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses which the Lord God of Israel had given the king granted him all his requests he went to the king and he wanted something and he had enough influence and he had enough weight with the king that his petition was granted and we'll see it just a little bit of that uh, we won't dwell on it very long but uh, he must have been influential for that to happen and this happened in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes which I think they think was maybe about 457 BC or something along <clears throat> along that time frame but I uh, I have, I've looked at some of those timelines, but they're hard to remember. There's so many of them as you go down through there. They're, they're hard to remember. And none of them, although we pretty much uh, think, or, or people pretty much think, the scholars and people who study those types of things, are fairly certain that they have a lot of this time, the timelines figured out. And, and I know in the church we have uh, done some extensive studies, some people have, and have pretty much uh, think we have it figured out, but it's still an imprecise uh, science, so to speak. But that's when it could have been. But, but anyway, in uh, verse 7, he said, Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, gatekeepers, the Nathim, came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon, and the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him, which this was um, um, a long journey, first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month, so that's four or five months that he was on the road. I Yesterday, as I mentioned, I was in Chagrin Falls, and I went to, it was, there's an orchard there, and the fellow that owns it, he was telling me the story of how they came to get this land. His ancestors had walked, now this was just a couple of them, walked all the way from Connecticut to Chagrin Falls, Ohio, in that area. And they staked out 500 acres of land there that they were able to get. I think, I don't know if it fell under the homestead law or how they were able to get it. I don't think they had to buy it. I don't know if it was a, uh, uh, really, in 1817 maybe, or 16 is when Krakatoa blew up. And there was, they, there was a claim, I've read it in books, that every month in the state of Ohio there was snow that particular year because the the volcanic ash from Krakatoa you know, obscured the sun and and kept it from uh, warming the earth and so there was snow and that's why they came here from Connecticut because they were looking for they had no crops out there so they came and there was a lot of poverty because of it so they came all the way walked all the way to Chagrin Falls and once they had staked out their claim they walked back got their family and came out here by ox cart, which is maybe almost slower than walking. But they brought their belongings along. And they, they, they still, his family, none of his family is there. And I, thought, I found this sort of uh, saddening. He is an only child. Everybody else in his family, his uncles who had children, none of them stayed there. And they had this 500 acres. And they, when they got the inheritance, they lived in California and Colorado and different places. They sold it all. They just got rid of it that had been in their family since 1818. He's the last one. He was an only child. 
and he has no children. When he's gone, that's the end of that heritage. But he has a, a beam in his building there that was from that original barn that they built in 1819, maybe. Or, nine, yeah, 1819, when they first built a barn there. It was from the property, and I think it's an oak beam that was hand hewn, and he saved it from one of the old barns. So it was sort of cool to see, and I, I found that fascinating that uh, people, you know, to find the history of something, something like that. But I also thought, wow, what a, what a tragedy that it's all going to end now. There's only 32 acres left of the land, of the original land. But anyway, they walked for four to five months to get from where they were in Babylon all the way up to Jerusalem. Now, they did have, I'm sure that possibly not all of them walked because we'll see a little uh, uh, indication probably of that here in a minute. But what I wanted to get to was verse 10. This verse has always fascinated me. I think it's a fascinating verse because it says for he that they went there, took that journey, in verse 9, and he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, to teach it, and he had prepared to seek his heart. He had studied the, the, the law. He had studied God's way. So he could become totally familiar with God's way. That was his whole goal in life up to this point. To teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. That was his goal. To keep it alive. To keep it going. He was in captivity, but he still made the effort to make sure that his people, his brethren, if you will, would still know God's way, even in captivity, that it wouldn't die out, that that flame would still flicker. And I thought that was a tremendous testimony or testament to Ezra and what kind of a person he was. And he went to Artaxerxes, and here is what he got. He got a letter, and it's written here. This, it says, verse 11, this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra. Now, it might have been... It's possible that there was more to it than, the, than what we have here, but uh, it seems like it's almost intact. And, of course, they still ruled Judea. They still ruled Jerusalem. So he could, this king could send that letter, and those who he came in contact with would have to obey it because they were compelled to. Otherwise, they wouldn't because there are indications of back pressure Anyway, in, in, in this section of or in, the, in Ezra in general. But in verse 14, he said, Whereas, this is what Artaxerxes wrote. Can you imagine this? He, this was a king that was their, their captor. This was a king who had these slaves and these people under his control. He says, Whereas, you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire, verse 14, Concerning Judah, this, this was uh, Ezra's instruction, concerning Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand. This was his mission, to go and see what's happening because some captives had already gone back uh, years, years before to tr uh, rebuild the temple and to some extent rebuild the city. But this is what he sent them for, and he gave them a letter to this effect that he is to do this. It's, he did these things with his whole heart. He didn't shy away from, from just because it got difficult. He wholeheartedly did what this letter sent him to do. And I want to just look quickly at those three things that he did. He studied the law and God's way. He did God's law and God's way, and he passed it on. He taught God's way. He was a teacher of God's way. And so we're going to look just at a, at a couple of incidences or a couple of 
indications of what we are to do as well in, in doing those three things wholeheartedly. The first one, studying God's way. Now, one of the places, and we'll turn there, that we think of first when we think about study, and that is 2 Timothy, the uh, second chapter in verse 15. I like it better in the King James Version that I do really in the New King James, which is what I'm reading from today. The, the New King James said in verse 15, it said, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. In the King James it said, Study to show yourself approved. It just has a better ring and a better feel and gives a better indication of what's being talked about here. But it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. And it's not just reading the word of God. He says, rightly dividing the word of God, because, or of truth, because we know that the word of God is not everything about something, is not in one place. It's here a little, there a little. It fits together a little bit like a puzzle, and we have to get the pieces and put them together so we can see all sides of, a, of an issue, so we can see all sides of an issue. Uh, of a uh, uh, particular case, people love to take Paul's writings and use them for their own proof texting for things that, that you know, they say whether it's the law is done away with or uh, clean and unclean meats, we can eat anything. I, I don't think we could eat the, the death angel mushroom. I don't think he made that one clean for him, so I guess they missed out a little bit. But at any rate, we can, uh, they, they, they use those claims. But Peter said in one of his letters, he said that Paul writes of things difficult, and I should have put the verse down so we, so we could turn there or so at least you could refer to it. But he said, Paul writes of things that are hard to be understood, which people use, he said, to rest things to their own destruction. They, they use things to make to a proof text here and there, see what Paul said and, and so forth, to use it so that they can justify what they're doing, whether it's not keeping the Sabbath or whether it's, it's uh, any, any of a number of other things, uh, including the food they eat and so forth. But anyway, going on in uh, uh, the third chapter, it's just over the page here in my Bible, he says, rightly dividing the word, we have to dissect it correctly here in verse 15 of, of chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. Then in ver, uh, chapter 3, another familiar scripture. He says, all, in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, which is teaching. It's profitable for us to have, we have doctrines that we uh, are sort of the body of what we believe, the church of God. And it comes from the Bible. When we did the uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, that's what we, we found. It's good for reproof. It's good for correction. And, of course, if we read much of the Bible, at least I do, maybe you don't so much, but I do, find a lot of places where I can be corrected from the word of God. And it's good for instruction in righteousness. It's good for showing us what we should be doing, where we should be going. Righteousness means rightness, which means doing the right thing. And this is all good for all those things. It is good for us, as we study the Bible, to keep these things in mind. In Psalms, the 86th chapter, Psalm 86, and I, I, I was thinking... And we'll go there for just a minute also, but uh, if we had nothing but just 119 Psalm, we could be pretty well informed about a lot of, a lot of things. <clears throat> and when it comes to the law, uh, it really clarifies things. But Psalm 86, verse 11, I just wanted to read this, this one verse. And it says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. As we study God's word, God is teaching us if we're pliable, if we're receptive to it. He says, teach me your word, O Lord, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. In other words, don't have a divided heart like, like um, the uh, 
uh, Amaziah the king did, or like David Duchovny did when uh, he was found out that the heart that's in his girlfriend is was his former wife's heart, his deceased wife's heart. And then let's turn on to um, chapter 119 for a couple of quick verses. Chapter 119, and and we will toward the latter part of the book. <coughs> Obviously, chapter 119 of uh, Psalms, being the longest chapter, has a lot of verses in it. It's in verse 147 and 148 is what we're looking at here. And this is what David said he did, and this is a good example for us. He said, I rise before the dawning of the morning. In other words, he gets up early in the morning for a reason. He says, I cry for help. I hope in your word, when he wakes early in the morning, I hope in your word, my eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Now, meditate in another place, I think in the first chapter of uh, Psalm says that it's talking aloud to yourself, which is uh, probably sort of true if you're thinking of things and it's sort of mulling things over. It's trying to figure things out and it's part of studying God's word is meditating so we can digest what it is that we have heard or what we have read or what we're talking about. Meditating is an important part of it. The second, the second thing that Ezra did was he did God's way. He did what God, what he learned. He studied the law but it wasn't just a, an, an exercise in intellectualism or uh, to be wise or whatever. It was so he would know how to live his life. So he could live his life in a profitable and in a way that worked so that he could win in life, so to speak. And there, here again, we'll go to a familiar scripture in James, James, the first chapter. James 1, and I love the book of James because it's so pragmatic, it's practical, and it has a lot of things in it that we can apply almost constantly. <coughs> and it's about the hearers or the doers. James 1, 22 to 25. In 22, verse 22, it says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of a man that he was. It's sort of funny sounding, but I was thinking about that too, and I'm thinking, you know, if I looked in the mirror, I probably I would probably forget which way, which side of my head my hair is parted on. But if I do it, I can remember it, and that's what he's saying here. The doers. The, or the hearers only, they hear it and then right away they forget it and they're gone on to something else. It's just an intellectual exercise to them. But he who looks, verse 25, into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And that's what we want to do. We want to be blessed in what he, we do. We'll quickly go to Matthew, the seventh chapter, to just build on that for just a minute. At the end of the seventh chapter, Matthew 7, and this is, of course, the famous um, Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave, which is probably the longest set of instructions on living, godly living, that is in the Bible, at least that Jesus Christ did. In verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He who does the will of my Father. Not the hearers, but the doers. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? I will declare to them, I never knew you. You were hearers, but you were not doers, he's saying. I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, and he makes an example and an analogy, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doesn't do him, who's a hearer and not a doer, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, not those who hear and doesn't do them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew, and he beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And we can imagine how that went. The rain came, floods came, winds blew, and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. It's very, very important that we do what we learn from God's word. Because if not, we're headed for destruction in terms of our walk with God. Then the third thing he did, he taught God's way, teaching God's way. One of the places that we read about this is in 1 Peter, the third chapter. It's about defending the faith. Now, this is about Christian apologetics or uh, so-called or defending the faith when it is comes under fire and so forth. It asks us to be involved in that. We are supposed to be doing that. In, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 3, verse 13. Let's see. Did I get the right one? Chapter 3. I must have written down the wrong... No, the fifth, verse 15. It says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. There's a way to do it, and it's not in arrogance and boasting and making it look as though we're better than everybody else. It's with meekness. And with fear, reverential fear of leading someone the wrong direction. That's what we have to be cognizant of. And goes on a little further in Matthew about teaching God's way, Matthew, the 28th chapter. It, um, sorry to go so, so fast through these, but... Uh, I see the clock is ticking down, and uh, I should have, uh, you know, as they say, the hurrier I get, the behinder I get, so maybe that's what's happening. But at any rate, in uh, verse 28, or chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 19 and 20, this is one of the requirements that we are to be involved in as a God-fearing follower of Jesus Christ. Directly from Jesus Christ in verse 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teaching them to, to observe all things that I have commanded you. We're to be in a teaching role, and that teaching role may not be the way we think of it all the time. In Acts, the first chapter, it uh, <clears throat> looks as though it could be taken more way than just speaking or telling something. Somebody's some, something. First chapter of Acts, <clears throat> in verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. That's what we are to be. We are to be witnesses for God. And that is teaching in an elemental form, in an elementary way. It means that we are to be the kind of example that people can look at and learn from. How does God's way work? That's what we're supposed to be doing, transferring or transforming those things into action. Ezra accomplished his, his mission, and his mission was, as we read, there in Ezra, the uh, seventh chapter, to, to go back and teach and to find out the status and so forth, because he was a priest and he was to keep 
the the uh, religion of the Jews going. He was going uh, going to promote it, to propagate it, and so forth. He was successful, even though it was extremely difficult. In Ezra the uh, tenth chapter, back to the end of it, the book of Ezra, and you don't need need to necessarily turn there. I'll I'll read it in the tenth chapter. And this is in verse 11 and 12. It says, now therefore, um, he's, he's uh, talking to the nation, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. And in verse 12, they said, the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, yes, as you have said, so we must do. Now this, you'd have to read the whole thing. I'll just quickly mention what it was about. They had married, the people who had gone back had married in the pagan society and they had all these pagan customs and idolatry and so forth, pagan gods, and they had intermingled with the pagans which they were forbidden to do. They, they were not supposed to do because like Solomon who married all those pagan wives, they were led astray by those pagan wives. They had done that, <clears throat> so now there's a day of accounting. And this accounting means that they have to separate from those wives. And as difficult as it was to do, they agreed to do it at the request of Ezra. Ezra was successful in <coughs> excuse me, establishing a better society that followed God more clearly. And that was his job. His mission was to go back and to be do his priestly duties of teaching the law and doing what he was supposed to do. And that's what he did. And he was successful because he gave his whole heart to the project. He learned what he had to learn. He prepared his heart. He fixed his heart on God. And that's exactly what we must do. Give our whole heart into serving God. We can't be one foot in the world and one foot in God's way. It just doesn't work. A divided heart will eventually lead us astray. Ezra knew that and that's why, <coughs> excuse me, why he did what he did. So what does God want from our heart? He wants us to turn to him. The title of the message is the same as the title of the movie, Return to Me. And it, it means, return to me, meaning to God. He wants our undivided attention. He wants us to turn to him and to be with him with our whole heart, with everything we have. He wants us to be all in. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, Jesus Christ was being set up by the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and some of those people who were always trying to trip him up. In this particular case, they, they sent a lawyer, this was the Pharisees, sent a lawyer out there and this was a student of the law to try and trick him with a, with a question, thinking that maybe he couldn't, under, he couldn't overcome this. And he asked him, this lawyer, he said in verse 36 of chapter 22, teacher, he acknowledged that Christ was a teacher. Which is the great commandment in the law? He thought, well, maybe he would pick one of the Ten Commandments or something. Well, he didn't do that. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is with the whole heart. And that's what we are to do. That's what we are to make sure that we do. And he was quoting the Old Testament. He was quoting Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and this is the last scripture we'll go to. Deuteronomy chapter six. And I think this is a one of the key scriptures in the entire Bible. Certainly the, whole, uh, the Old Testament. And what it says there in verse one, this is the commandment, this is Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. 
This is the commandment and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. We are to be studying and learning these things that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you. You and your son, your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to do. Be careful to observe. Hear it, learn it, be careful to do it. Observe it, that it may be well with you. It's for our own good, he's saying, which is the same thing the 119th chapter says. And it's in the long term, of course, as we have, um, uh, as we've become Christians and God's spirit dwells in us, it's for eternity. And that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. But here, here are some of the key things. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love, this is what Christ quoted from the Old Testament, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And is he saying that you're just to hear this? He says, no. These words which I sh command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently. That part is part of our job is to teach. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. So that's all the time. We are to be a living example as well as we are supposed to pass it on to our children and to those who are around us. If we practice these things wholeheartedly like Ezra did, if we put our whole heart into it and we learn God's way, we make sure that we study it, we make sure that we understand it, and if we practice God's way, if we practice God's way, and if we witness God's way, if we teach it, and as a living example, if we do these things, if we witness these things, and teach these things, and do them, we will be like that wise man that built his house on the rock. And when the storms of life come and go, we will still be left standing.